Okay, well, we are just past time, um, and I trust everybody can hear me okay. So I want to welcome you to this first of our climate. Je veux vous souhaiter la bienvenue dans ce premier webinar de pollinisateurs climatiques. Nous sommes ravis que vous soyez ici avec nous, et nous nous réjouissons à l'idée de passer une heure à discuter de l'un des problèmes les plus urgents auxquels l'Église mondiale est confrontée, c'est-à-dire le changement climatique. Je m'appelle Doug Graben Newfeld, je suis le président du groupe de travail de la CMM pour la protection de la création. Je voudrais faire une brève introduction et je passerai la parole à ceux qui nous guideront à travers quelques histoires de pollinisateurs climatiques. Ce webinaire est le fruit d'une collaboration entre la Conférence Ménénite mondiale et l'Anabaptist Climate Collaborative. La jeunesse de ces histoires remonte à un projet d'enquête mondiale que le groupe de travail pour la protection de la création avait entrepris, où nous avons recueilli des informations auprès des membres de la CMM du monde entier sur leurs expériences et leurs opinions concernant les questions liées à la protection de la création. Et le site Internet de la CMM a une série d'articles qui décrivent ces résultats qui sont très intéressants je vais mettre là une copie dans le chat. Euh, il y aura aussi un lien vers la, la page principale du groupe de travail pour la protection de la création, où vous pourrez voir notre mandat et aussi les sept membres du groupe. Ça devrait être dans le, dans le chat, dans la fenêtre de discussion. Le groupe de travail est donc composé d'un représentant de chacune des cinq régions de la CMM. Et j'aimerais vous présenter Sibono de Mombé qui animera le webinaire une fois que nos présentateurs auront commencé. Sibono Kouché vient du Zimbabwe. Elle s'est engagée depuis longtemps et de façon différente pour la protection de la création. Vous avez sans doute déjà entendu ses discours qui sont toujours inspirants. Elle est récemment diplômée de l'Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary à MBS et elle travaille actuellement pour le Mennonite Mission Network. Dans le cadre de la collecte des données de l'enquête, demander aux gens de nous raconter brièvement euh, quel impact le changement climatique a eu sur elles, sur eux, et de quelle façon ils s'engagent dans la protection de la création. Et nous avons découvert une collection riche de récits et de témoignages qui venaient du monde entier, qui nous ont inspirés et qui nous ont poussés à approfondir notre réflexion sur les réponses de l'Église en matière de protection de la création. Je vous présente Sierra Ross Richer, qui est l'autrice des histoires de poly, du pollinisateur climatique. Elle, a, elle est diplômée du Goshen College. Elle travaille pour le ACC, l'Anabaptist Climate Collaborative. Elle travaille actuellement dans une ferme en Ontario et elle a une grande expérience de l'étranger. Elle écrit aussi très bien. C'était la personne idéale pour ce projet. Alors, au niveau logistique, euh, il y aura le temps pour poser des questions à la fin. Mais si vous prenez la parole, merci de ne pas parler trop vite parce que cette conférence est traduite en français pour plusieurs de nos participants. Euh, nous enregistrons aussi ce webinaire pour qu'il soit diffusé en direct sur Facebook et les commentaires seront disponibles pour le public. Merci à tous ceux qui s'occupent de ces détails techniques. Je passe la parole à Sierra. Bonjour tout le monde, je m'appelle Sierra Ross Richer, comme l'a dit Doug. Je suis l'autrice de la série du pollinisateur climatique qui a été créée au printemps dernier. Cette série, c'est un projet sur lequel j'ai travaillé pour l'Anabaptist Climate Collaborative dans le cadre de l'une de ces stratégies de lutte contre le changement climatique qui est de renforcer la diversité des, fois, des voix. Les deux autres stratégies sont le développement des leaders émergents et la création de réseaux autour de l'action climatique. 
Le pollinisateur climatique a été publié à l'origine comme une lecture quotidienne pendant Carême et a été compilé ensuite dans un livre que vous pouvez trouver sur notre site web. Pour ce livre, j'ai interviewé 43 anabaptistes dans 15 pays et j'ai écrit une série de 48 articles courts sur la façon dont ils vivent le changement climatique et ce qu'ils font pour y répondre. Le nom de pollinisateur climatique fait référence à la façon dont les pollinisateurs comme les abeilles elles, aident les plantes à fleurs à produire des fruits en répandant le pollen entre les peuples, entre les plantes dispersées. Pardon. Alors que l'église anabaptiste discerne comment répondre à la crise climatique, nous pouvons bénéficier des expériences et des idées des uns et des autres. Et j'espère que les histoires que vous entendrez aujourd'hui et dans les prochains webinaires vous inspireront à une nouvelle action. J'aimerais donner un peu un contexte de la région sur laquelle on se concentre aujourd'hui, qui est l'Afrique. Un rapport de l'Organisation météorologique mondiale publié cette année indique que l'Afrique est touchée de manière disproportionnée par le changement climatique. Le continent produit moins de 10 des émissions mondiales de gaz à effet de serre, mais les sécheresses, euh, les vagues de chaleur, les tempêtes, les inondations l'affectent plus que d'autres régions comme l'Amérique du Sud ou l'Europe. Plus de la moitié des habitants d'Afrique vivent de l'agriculture, ce qui signifie qu'ils sont directement touchés par ces risques naturels, ainsi que par les problèmes environnementaux qui sont liés, comme la déforestation, la désertification et la pollution. Alors, tout le monde à qui j'ai parlé en Afrique ne vit pas le changement climatique de la même, de la même manière. Pour certains, c'est les tempêtes de pluie et les inondations qui sont les plus grands défis, alors que pour d'autres, il n'y a, a eu pas de pluie pendant de, depuis des années. Mais un thème commun revient dans chaque entretien, qui est que les schémas des de saisons sont en train de changer. Il fait sec alors que c'est la saison des pluies. Il y a des orages alors qu'il devrait faire sec. Partout, les personnes qui ont longtemps souvenu à leurs besoins en cultivant leur nourriture et en élevant les animaux se demandent ce qu'il faut faire quand les ressources de base et les schémas saisonniers dont nous dépendons ne sont plus fiables. Les trois intervenants d'aujourd'hui nous feront part de quelques-uns des moyens qu'ils ont mis en œuvre, ou eux ou leur communauté, pour répondre à cette question. Notre premier orateur aujourd'hui, c'est Joël Lankas, qui nous rejoint du Kenya. Joël est membre du groupe Maasai dans le sud du Kenya, et il travaille pour l'initiative de développement intégré Maasai, MIDI. Joël prépare actuellement un diplôme en gestion stratégique pour le développement communautaire. Et en plus de ça, dans sa maison de Kimuka à Kajiado, Joël élève du bétail. C'est aussi un pionnier du jardinage et de la plantation d'arbres. Quand j'ai parlé avec Joël ce printemps, il m'a fait part des difficultés croissantes auxquelles est confronté le peuple Maasai. Au cours des 30 dernières années, des sécheresses prolongées ont asséché les sources d'eau et anéanti les herbes utilisées pour faire paître le bétail. Et en même temps, les Maasai, qui traditionnellement élevaient des vaches nomades, élevaient des vaches, étaient des éleveurs nomades. Euh, ils doivent aujourd'hui apporter des changements majeurs à leur mode de vie. Joël nous parlera de certaines des solutions sur lesquelles Midi travaille pour relever ses défis et des expériences qu'il met en place dans la famille. Euh, une deuxième oratrice sera Suko Lutle Nube. Elle a euh, passé l'année dernière aux États-Unis à faire du bénévolat à Goshen, Indiana, euh, dans le cadre du programme IVEP du, du MCC. Suko est membre de l'église de Lobengula, euh, de l'église des frères en Christ. Et lors de notre entretien, elle nous a parlé des moyens qui étaient mis en œuvre par son, par son assemblée pour construire une communauté plus résiliente face au changement climatique. De nombreux membres de l'Église, dont la famille de Souko, augmentent leurs revenus en cultivant certaines, certains de leurs aliments de base, comme le maïs, le millet, le sorgho, dans des parcelles agricoles situées à l'extérieur de la ville. Les conditions météorologiques sont de plus en plus imprévisibles et aujourd'hui, Souko nous fera part des moyens qui ont été mis en œuvre par son Église pour résoudre ce problème. Et notre dernier intervenant, Shadrek Kenwadayama, nous rejoint depuis le Malawi. Il est évêque de l'église des frères Ménonites au Malawi, directeur de la conférence des frères Ménonites du Malawi. Malawi va parler des, des défis auxquels sont confrontés les membres des 50 églises Ménonites du Malawi. 
la déforestation, les violentes tempêtes, des inondations. Au cours des 50 dernières années, la déforestation pour la culture du tabac et la production du charbon de bois a décimé les forêts du pays. Les tempêtes de pluie devenaient de plus en plus violentes et la disparition des arbres aggrave les inondations. Il y a dix ans, des dirigeants et des membres de la communauté du, euh, des frères Mélenites au Malawi ont commencé à se demander qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire pour résoudre ce problème. Et aujourd'hui, Shadrach nous parlera de la réponse qu'ils ont trouvée et de la façon dont les églises ont répondu. Je remercie chacun de nos intervenants d'avoir accepté de partager leur histoire et nous, nous, sommes, nous sommes impatients de vous écouter. This means that most of the people in my community they base on agriculture. So um, having a good climate or what we have had before, it's a really good thing because we are able to plan, we know what to do um, in order to get more food and keep going and survive. But now what climate change has done is it has, it has altered our rain patterns. That's the first, first thing. Usually um, long back from What I know and what I've gathered from a few people around me is that the rains usually come around October. That's when the rains start and they'll start maybe we just have light rains and then they come in as they go and then they start to be more and more. But now um, for the past years and apart from this year and the last year when I read my story, we had late rains that would come around November or even beginning of December and that is very late for people really based in agriculture, people really based in farming only. So that means that um, they have to wait and start their planting or maybe by towards the end of the year, which is a challenge already. And for this year, like for example, for the past, for this week, we have had two days where we had so much rain and it's mid October. So it's, it's changing so much which means it needs someone to adapt. And it's even hard to say, oh, we can prepare the land at this point in time because the rains are going to come here because we don't know what's going to happen next because it has changed so much. So that is a challenge on its own. And then as a community say, what do we do in case of this challenge? And the other challenge also that is there because of climate change is that there's been so much heat that most some that we have some rivers that have dried up and we also have some dens that have dried up There is no water. Life, livestock, it's a challenge also on livestock. It's a, it's a challenge on people in the villages and all that. Where do they get water? They have to travel a long way to get water and all that, which is a very big challenge. Um, so all these things are leading to food insecurity, to poverty, to a lot of struggle amongst our people in our communities. And then coming on to what the church has done, Um, in 2022, in May, in my church in Lobong Library, you see where I go to, we had what we call a business expo, whereby we invited all the congregate, all the congregants to um, those who are running small businesses, because that's how people survive also here. You have to be selling something at least so that you get a little bit of income, you can, you can be able to then finance your agricultural project. So we asked them to bring whatever they are selling to the church. It wasn't during the church service, it was very separate, just to be clear, but we had to invite them to come with whatever they are selling so that we know who is selling what and to, to make a market for everybody through us as a congregation. Because if you have something that you're selling, but you don't have someone to sell to, then that is a challenge. So that really went well because we had a lot of people coming in with the things that they were selling and a lot of people knowing that I can get this from this person rather than traveling it a lot to get something that you can get from your fellow brethren in the church. So that was the first strategy that the church did. So, and now we're also planning another business expo because it's going to be done yearly. And then the other thing also on that note is that we usually encourage people to have conversations about how they are surviving or, the, or about survival um, mechanisms that they are using in their farms. Because we have a lot of farmers in the church and some of them, Um, they've tried these different methods and they've worked with them. For example, today, I talked to one of our um, former senior pastors at Lobyong Labes, and he was telling me that, you know what, these rains have came like, like these rains came like this. It's pretty early, we didn't expect them, you know, but I'm telling you that I'm going to go and plant so that if, if they don't come in the next month until December, it's fine, I'll replant, but if they come, that's good, which means I'm going to harvest. So. It's, it's a resilient strategy in him that he has tried and tested for himself that works. 
that, okay, I get it, the rains are not stable, but the little that I've got, I'm still going to plant. If it doesn't work out, I'll redo it again. If it works out, we then go. So we encourage them to have this conversation so that they can help each other and try different things. And then last but not least, we have um, an organization that works with the church that is called Compassionate and Development Services, which is a non-profit making organization that seeks to help members of the community. But now when we come to this organization, they don't only help congregants or people just around the church. We go all the way out to the community, people that we live with that even are not our, our member of the church or our relatives. So they concentrate on um, places that are affected mostly by the climate change. Like for example, um, villages where there are a lot of older people and we older people, women and children that do not have a life in the city at all because there are people like that who just live in the village and that's all. So that's where they are focused whereby um, they do different projects. One of the, I'll just mention a few things that they do that actually help to adjust to this climate change crisis. First thing, they help them on farming methods that will help them to at least harvest. And then second thing, they have other projects, like for example, borehole drilling projects, so that they're able to access water easily. Um, because like I've mentioned earlier, earlier, that most of the rivers have dried up and it's, it's really a terrible crisis. So some rivers that our grandparents know that they have never dried before, no matter what they know that they go to the specific river, but this time around they dried up in some dams they dried up, which is a crisis. So they help with drilling balls so that they can access water easily. And also they do peace building programs. And it could be, it could be like, you, you could wonder like, what would peace building, what would a peace building project do to climate change? But if people are not in harmony, it's hard for them to take all those things that we are trying to bring to them. So it's hard for them to take these things and, and implement them and they produce effective results. So we really, they really do um, a lot of peace building activities within these communities. And then they come in, they now teach them the farming methods for drilling and all that. So maybe just to go back to another um, point of the farming methods. Here we are saying that since we're based on agriculture so much, the rains are delaying, what should we do that's deep cut? Now they go deeper into saying that, for example, if you cultivate your land earlier before the rains come, when they come, the soil, the soil is loose enough to hold in water and the moisture so that um, when the little rain that comes during the first, like um, the first rains that come during the rain season, they're able to like stay a little bit in the soil, you know, while they're still waiting for the second batch of rain, something like that. So they're able, if they plant during that time, if they, they get the little rains and the soil is still moist and then they plant, they might be able, they might be, um, in a good place to harvest something, even if the second rain come, which means they're able to what? To harvest. And also, um, they are also taught some, they are also taught irrigation farming. Since they have balls that have been um, brought closer to them, they're also taught how to use that liquid water to be able to like um, manage their small gardens. They won't be, some of them, they do small gardens, some of them, they won't be that small, but they won't be as big as, uh, maybe a very huge farm. These are these are a survival mechanisms that this organization is trying to bring to the people so that they keep going to address the issue also of what of food insecurity. So they also have, apart from the big farms, they also have some small gardens that they have maybe where they grow vegetables, things like that. And then they do irrigation farming to keep them going. Whatever they get, they can keep for their family a little bit and some of it sell so that they, they get income and survive. And also the other point is that um, we, they advise farmers to resort to drought resistant crops. So that these are crops whereby if you plant them, they can survive even in the minimal water or in harsh weather, they are able to survive. And then they're also, they're able to like harvest them and they address the issue of food insecurity too. So basically um, this is, what my church from another point of view is trying to do. So when I also when I'm saying my my church like um I'm I'm not looking at like Lobeng Library, I see where I go to only because this organization, like I mentioned, that it doesn't only work with our congregants and all that. It's an organization that works with BICC, 
um, Brethren in Christ Church at large. So we also branch out into even other Brethren in Christ churches in Zimbabwe because this is a crisis for all of us. So communityness of the community is very important to us and we really um, try and come into that. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Sugo, for sharing the multi-pronged strategies um, that you have been participating in or been witness to as the church has been responding within its context in Zimbabwe. Uh, may I take this time to welcome Shadrach Kwendanyama, who will talk to us about planting trees uh, in Malawi and much more. Welcome, Shadrach. It's a pleasure to hear from you today. So as uh, Shadrach prepares to um, present, I hope that you are preparing your questions uh, or your comments because uh, this is a climate pollination series. Uh, the community of exchange and a community of resilience building. Is Shadrach able to connect? Right. Okay, our time is not waiting. How about Joel? Joel, are you in? Joel, talking about gardening uh, in drought in Kenya. Joel, would you like to unmute yourself and uh, share your stories? Joel says he cannot hear me. All right, let's see if you can um, keep working on that as I work on it here on my side. Um, does anyone, perhaps as we wait for Joel and Shadrach, have a question or a comment about what Suvo just shared about? You can type in your question in the chat as we think about how other siblings in creation are coping with the changing climate in their context. So, Subo, can you say a bit about Oh, there you go. Sandy Platt says she really appreciated your story, Sugo. Can you say which country and which community you're from? Oh, thank you. Um, I am from Zimbabwe, uh, specifically in the city of Blawayo. And I am from the Brandon Christchurch community. And yeah. Um, I'm from the village called Iris Bell. That's a village where I come from in my Tabula Land province. Thank you. Can you can you type the community names into the chat so we can read them? So I can read them. Oh. <laughs> right. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you for your stories. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Sugo. I suppose we will all have to speak slower because um, there is translation going on. Um, Shadrach, do you want to come in now? Maybe I can come in. So let me okay. say sorry, sorry very much. My gadgets have been uh, very troubling. We have had rains today, heavy rains. I 
I hope we are, I'm clear. Yes, we're hearing okay. you clearly. So you will also have to speak um, slowly. Um, okay. Yes. I'm Shedrick Quindanyama from Malawi. I'm the bishop and the director of MB Malawi, Mennonite Brethren Church in Malawi. So we have a number of churches which I'm leading, more than 50. In this story, I said 50 which are taking part in planting trees. So in short, let me just go about what we are doing in Malawi. Let me say, start with, as I've said, today we have received heavy rains. We did expect to have these rains. Because our land is just bare, we have had great runoff of water, sweeping all roads, sweeping other gardens which are just bare without ridges. Why? It's because even our waterways, our land is just bare. There are no trees, there are no ways where water can be hot. So in Malawi, as I'm saying, the weather pattern now has changed. We may have rains or not. At the time we were expecting rains, it's when you see it's just hot, very hot. Just means the climate has changed. Let me go to the story in Malawi, Malawi had trees, so many trees, natural. If you talk of artificial, these artificial trees were planted maybe in the cities. But if you talk of trees in the villages, most of them, if you talk of artificial, it was fruit trees. But both fruits and natural trees, indigenous trees have gone. Why? The challenge has been since in the 1970s to the up to 90s, people in Malawi have been growing tobacco, fruit cured, dead cured, and even bad tobacco. We cure using trees. This has been a very big challenge in Malawi. As of recent, the most using, the most energy we are using in our homes, including me here I am, we use charcoal. Almost 95% in Malawi use charcoal. So where, the question can be, where are we getting charcoal? Now, even the small trees have gone. People, you will see women digging the stumps. Which just shows there is nothing. And I don't know. In 10 years' time, what are we going to do? We need to change. We need to start it now. 
So even the growth of tobacco has gone down because there are no trees, people are, there, there has been no impact on, on tobacco, the benefits from tobacco. In my starting point, I said, today we have had a lot of runoff water. When it comes into rain season, we always have floods everywhere, everywhere in Malawi. You go everywhere, there are floods. Just listen to, we have had cyclone Fred. All trees in the hills have gone. Now the trees, the, the hills are broken. The instant we had in southern region of Malawi. It's everywhere. We have a land of water with big force from the hills. Down there, everything is gone. The topsoil has gone, and we have so many gardens. But as a church in Malawi, Mennonite Brethren Church, we just, just decided to take part in reforestation around the churches, around our homes, and even those who have got some areas where they can, uh, uh, the, uh, the other people who are saving some, some uh, small forests, some woodlots, we are encouraging them, let's go and plant trees. So we are planting trees around the churches, around homes, and even we have been now starting encouraging people not to cut some trees. Those small, small, because it's very unfortunate now. Those who are not, who cannot find firewood, who cannot find charcoal, they use mess stocks for cooking. Do you think that food, is it well cooked? It's very unfortunate. So we are going back to the, uh, village to village, house to house, as a church. We should be an example to the community. We are not targeting only church members, but as a community, because this challenge is on, not only for the church, it's all, it has affected each and everyone. So we are targeting communities, we are targeting, we'll be also targeting schools as of late. So what we are doing is, we're encouraging um, communities to have nurseries, three nurseries. Ah, oh, thank you, Shadra. Uh, allow you. me to stop you there for now. Um, and thank you so much for sharing what the Mennonite uh, Brethren Church is doing in Malawi and how the landscape and the people are suffering together. Um, would like to take this opportunity to give Joel a chance to come in and tell his story. And then perhaps at the end uh, of Joel's story, we can um, hear more from you, Shadrach and uh, uh, Sugoluche. Over to you, Joel. Okay. Welcome, Joel. Good afternoon. Good, good afternoon. Oh, you can hear me? Yes, we can. You're oh, welcome. Thank you very much. Sorry, I was late for, for some minutes due to some unavoidable circumstances. Now, my name is Joel Lankas from Kenya. Uh, I'm going to speak on climate change and uh, also about the Maasai's, uh, a sub from Kenya. 
Uh, I work in an organization called Maasai Integrated Development Initiative, which get funds from Mennonite Central Committee, MCC. And uh, we come from a semi-arid area of Kajado West County. For those who know, for those who know Africa, East Africa in Kenya, uh, a county called Kajado, Kajado West sub-county, where pastoralists are common there. I come from that county. The semi as uh, the West, uh, it is, I'm going to speak about drought and how climate change is affecting our livestock. As the drought severity, severity cycle increases in our county, men leave women and children behind, moving their livestock in search for pasta and water, following the Joel? tradition. Joel, Hello? can you speak yep. loudly and a little slower? loudly and a little slower thank you okay thank you hello okay, I'm, I'm, am i fast hello can you hear me we can hear you you can continue Right. I would say focuses on Kajado County in Kenya. We come from the semi-arid area of Kajado West Sub County. Is susceptible to recurrent drought cycle as the drought se severity cycle increases. Men leave women and children behind moving the year livestock in search for pasta and water, following the year traditional migration routes through the northern part of the Rift Valley, central Kenya and further south crossing into Tanzania. We continue migrating in search of pasta and water until it rains again. When pasta regrow and water sources are filled, that's when men and livestock return home. Along this migration period, they, they encounter pasture related conflicts and other main sources of conflict in family separation during the prolonged drought. In the recent drought from, that is from 2016 to March, 2018, it was a very difficult drought in our country, especially uh, in our community. Uh, some of our domestic animals left under their care died, affecting their traditional food supply. On the other hand, local market food prices increases drastically due to reduced supply, making it hard to purchase food and children were withdrawn from school to assist in caring for their fragile community. This region is divided into two upper and lower region with different community activities taking place in each region. The upper region is around the Ngong Hills. I think Sierra knows Ngong Hills, he visited last time. The difference in this vegetation access, the difference is vegetation and also they are, it's near to small centers where people can access food. Settlement is more scarce as the lowland and rainfall frequency is better than the upperland. And livelihood practices slightly different because those in upperland do more of agro-pastoralist than the lower region along Magadi Road. Uh, livestock activities until recent as until recently, they are engaging in mixed farming and starting of income generating activities.
Hello. Yes, we can hear you, Joel. Can you hear me, Joel? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Right. Well, oh, thank hello. you. Okay. And and uh, this draw uh, uh, this problem is a result of climate change and land and land evacuation. Uh, just to to make the story short, let me speak about land evacuation because uh, these problems are brought uh, from land evacuation and climate change. Uh, in the nomadic pastoral Maasai, people have open grassland that is in the 70s and the early 80s. Uh, the whole Maasai community all use the whole land, uh, a bigger portion of land to graze their livestock. Uh, to, to graze their livestock. And the land was owned by the community before it was demarcated. In times of seasonal change and drought, homesteads would move as they search for pasta to feed their herds. However, land ownership has demonstrated a plot of land for each homestead. When I say demarcation now, everyone has his own plot. And landowners spend their farms, restricting the free movement of grazing. And, and, and routes to water were encroached. This has decreased the individual land access and water source option. Cultural conflicts, because land ownership has created a sellable product, the Maasai is, Maasai is a, a sub tribe, and I'm one of them. Landowners have sold land for cash or cows in response to the outside community pressure to buy land to meet the demands for housing for the Kenya population growth. The, the demarcation and sale of land have forced more cattle to confine to less, resulting in overgrazing and soil degradation. The construction of housing on traditional Maasai land has cut off some of the routes to migrate animals to other pastures during times of growth. These land issues changes in themselves are creating huge challenges for the Maasai communities of Kajado West Sub County. In the past, land was communion, as I said earlier, enabling the community to have more pasture space to keep large number of livestock for grazing. In, in late 1980s, when the land was demarcated to individual ownership, pastoral, pastoralism was affected with a bigger challenge to keep large numbers of livestock. That frequently community had clear strategies like harvesting of In this case, the community had clear strategies like harvesting of acacia forest from trees, setting aside piece of land, we call it Olegeri, FMNR concept, that will be used during high times of growth, like now. All these are sustaining measures we hope to help the community discover through capacity building and introduction of modern practices that goes along with the current community knowledge and experience. These are some of the pressures mounting thus the need for Maasai community to diversify livelihood using pasture manage system, which are integrated with the conservation agriculture concept that ensures sufficient and fresh food and water to kill to skilled household. It is worth noting that the major sources of global food insecurity range from disasters to climate conditions. The food insecurity crisis have been further stimulated to greater levels by man-made disasters and continuously cancelled progress on poverty reduction. Our organization 
approach strategy to based on understanding the different social, political, and institution and institutions situations that the project uh, intervention will be will be carried out, and it will ensure in oper in in, in it operates in a manner that adheres to international best best practices related to do no harm practices and principle to avoid reinforcing divisions and strengthen connection. Our organization will conduct training to enhance our awareness on participants on conflict sensitivity, equip them with skills to identify contextual factors as well as to seek solutions to mitigate divisions and tension that will otherwise be caused by these projects. Oh. Thank you very much, Joel. Uh, we'll have to stop you there for now. Um, it was very interesting to hear the integrated approach that your organization and the contiguous communities um, that it is serving um, uh, are, are employing as you seek to adapt to the changing climate. I would like to invite our participants to ask questions or make comments um, in these uh, remaining minutes of our webinar today. Could you kindly type in the chat box? And I think as we are waiting for the questions and the comments, uh, to come through, I noticed that uh, there's incessant rain in, in Ghana. Today, there's uh, a flood that started overnight and 26,000 households have been displaced as uh, Africa continues to be disproportionately affected by the changing climate. I perhaps want to ask a question to Shadrick to say, does is the rain uh, or the wet season uh, starting on time? What is happening in Malawi as far as the starting time of the wet season? Thank you very much. So, uh, actually, as I already said, we didn't expect to have rains today. We actually have our season, rain season, right away from 15 October up to March. But surprisingly, today we have had enough rains, and I believe for other people, they may grow their tobacco was the is too wet. We have had enough rains. But we expect uh, real rains from 15 November. All right, Sugo. You spoke about one of the farmers at your church talking about replanting. Are inputs available? as the communities try and uh, prepare themselves to plant and replant? Uh, thank you very much for that question. What I can say is that inputs are really not available, if I could sum it up in that way, but um, the strategy that I have seen that most farmers have adopted or what they do is that after every harvest, they do not um they do not um sell everything or eat everything or do whatever with everything they leave some for the next season in case by the time we have to start planting again we don't have enough funds to um go and get maybe the seeds and everything that we need to plant so that's the best story that most people have adopted they leave some from the previous harvest just a little bit that you get they make sure that they leave some and then also, um, there are some people like like I, I, I emphasize that we live in a 
in a system whereby being a community is a greater part of us. So also people tend to even share. If I have a lot of um, May seeds that I have cons that I would say that I have, I can share with my neighbor something like that. And if they have maybe sorghum, they can give me a little bit of sorghum. So that's how also people um, tend to have something to plant at this point in time. Thank you so very much. Joel, do you want to tell us more about how women and girls who we understand are mostly the ones who work the land, how are they coping in the context where you are serving? Did you hear the question, Joel? How are the women coping in your context? Would you like to unmute yourself? Right? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, during uh, land demarcation, uh, there were gender issues. There were traditionally uh, Maasai's families will move together as they migrate, uh, leaving the children and women behind. Uh, but uh, but uh, I think this modern days when the population is growing and the education is there, uh, there is women empowerment. And the women, so many women have gone to school uh, and so many now they can work for themselves. They can do some income generating activities, some income generating activities to earn some, to, to earn some money for themselves. So everything has changed because uh, women have yeah, uh, CA demo plots around the uh, uh, around the houses. Yeah. Uh, they do irrigation to sell to sell some food crops and have some money. Others do uh, VSLA, that is village and village village learning and saving association among themselves. So they loan some money to themselves and they. Uh, do some businesses around so they don't rely 100% on men to bring food on the table. They, they have also, they can also do other things to support their families. Others sell milk from the cows, from the goats to the nearby markets uh, and send their children to school and buy food stuff to the family to support to support their husbands and also to, to, to develop their families. Oh, thank you very much, Joel, Sugo and Shadrach for sharing generously um, of the stories of survival and resilience from your context. Sugo spoke about um, how the church encourages uh, members to be involved in business and she spoke about the Compassionate and Development Services arm of the church that encourages the people to participate in resilience building. And Shadrach spoke about how the church churches uh, in Malawi are encouraged to plant trees as a way of uh, arresting um, soil loss and runoff and healing the land. And Joel told us a lot about planting of gardeners, gardens and under and other. Uh, gender responsive um, solutions in his context. We have come to the end of our webinar today. Um, time has been jealous, but we have beautiful questions um, that came up on our chat. We will take those down and uh, send them to our presenters and hopefully then reroute them to you so you hear their answers to your questions 
thank you very much for making time to be with us to hear more about the Climate Pollinator Series as the Creation Care Task Force of the Mennonite World Conference collaborates with the Anabaptist Climate Collaborative. And thank you once again to Sierra um, for pulling these stories together. May Creator God bless you and strengthen you to be oh, present so. in your context building solutions for a hopeful future. Amen. <laughs>